วัสดีค่ะ Cars that can be driven by blind people might sound like a faraway dream, but in fact, it is already a reality. Associate Professor Dr. Dennis Hong from Virginia Tech, along with his team, has already built such a car. I talked to him about this, and while well, Dr. Hung is a very interesting person, apart from being a robot scientist, he's also a magician. So I asked him to please show us the science of magic. Dr. Hong, why are you interested in robots? Oh, robots are cool. <laughs> so this is a true story. When I was seven years old, when I was a small kid, uh, I watched the movie Star Wars for the yes. first time, and all the spaceships and robots just completely blew my mind. Especially R2D2, the, the, the trash can looking robot, and the mm -hmm. human robot C3PO. It was just fascinating. So, on my way back home in the car, I decided to become a robot scientist, and I'm here today. But we're not just, I'm just not doing robots just for, because it's cool and fun, but I truly believe that these robotics technologies can be used to increase people's lives, and that's what we're doing developing technology to help people's lives. What kind of robots are you working on right now? Oh, we're working on so many different robots. Um, one of the most exciting and the latest one is called Project Sapphire, Shipboard Autonomous Firefighting Robot, Sapphire. So it's a humanoid robot that's actually going to be used on Navy ships as a firefighting robot. And the interesting thing is it's a form of a humanoid robot. Uh, original proposal to the Navy, it's a Navy funded project, was I proposed a, the, the firefighting hose itself is a robot, so let's think of it as a snake robot. Uh -huh. And it finds the fire, and if there's a fire, props like a cobra, and, and sh you know, puts out the fire. So that was my original I mean, proposal. I mean, we, we control it from somewhere. Uh, so it could be remote controlled, teleoperated, but also it could be autonomous, meaning that it always tries to find the source of fires, and if there's a fire, it actually travels there. So uh, that was a great idea, and the Navy really liked it. But we went back to the, the Navy, the sponsor, and told them that, Oh, yeah, the, the snake robot is great, but what do you think about humanoid robots? Hmm. So we decided to actually do a humanoid robot, and there's a good reason why we want to use humanoid robots for firefighting for Navy ships too. Why? Uh, now first of all, if you've been to a Navy ship, it's a very uh, uh, difficult environment. The environment is actually designed for humans by humans. Uh, there's a reason why you're, they have your step size this much because the humans can walk. The, the passageway is really, really narrow. Right. And it, you know, those hatches that you open the doors, it has a very high door seal. Mm -hmm. So wheels or uh, tank tracks, they cannot go over these kind of uh, uh, surfaces. So thus, uh, legs is the way to go. Another thing is it's a ship, right? So it, has, it moves up and down a, a, a sea state. So wheels cannot do that, but legs can balance. But probably the most important thing is it's a firefighting robot, so it needs to protect, be protected against high temperature and fire. If you have wheels, you cannot cover it up because it mm -hmm. needs to continue to rotate. But if you have limbs, like humans, we, we can put on fire suits. Mm -hmm. So if a human can withstand the fire with fire suits, then a human -aid robot, you put on a fire suit, <laughs> and there you go. Are there any projects that you're working on that can be for everyday use? Everyday use. So actually, the, the ultimate goal of these firefighting robots or human -aid robots if the, 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 uh, the, the vision is we want this to be everyday use in the, the home environment or the domestic environment. I hate doing laundry, washing the dishes. We want to have robots living with us in our home, almost like science fiction, doing all the uh, things that we don't want to do, the domestic robots. So that's the, the, the ultimate goal for robotics, in my personal opinion. You design cars for blind drivers. Yes. How does it work? <laughs> that is a quite different project from our other robotics projects. So, this car for the blind is not a robot. So we do have a fully autonomous car, which is a robotic car, but this is not a robotics, a robotics car. This is a car where a blind person actually makes active decisions and drive to give them freedom, to give mm -hmm. them independence. Uh, how it works, uh, you know, we don't have a time, too much time to really explain everything, but basically, because the driver cannot see, the car needs to see for the blind. So we have a lot of different types of sensors, cameras, laser range finders, GPS systems. So the car gathers information around the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And all that information is then fed into the computer, and the computer is smart enough to try to understand what that means. So it creates an, uh, an understanding of the environment, so to speak. We call that the world model. And that information is transferred to the driver through many different types of non-visual user interfaces. And using this, the person can make active decisions and actually drive the car. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, how? how? Still, yeah. What, yeah, what type of interface sure. um, so, does the driver so, ever use? So I guess the key technology here is how do we convey a vast amount of information 
accurate enough and fast enough for a person who cannot drive. So yeah. this is where the non-visual user interfaces come into play. We developed dozens of different types of interfaces from vibrating vests to three-dimensional ping sound system, a shoe that applies pressure yeah. to the food. Uh, not all of them work. Some of them are more effective. Some of them are wacky ideas. Uh, but again, no such thing really existed. So we need to, you need to you know, figure out how to mm -hmm. do it. The, currently, we're using three interfaces. But by no means, uh, these are not the end of the story. This is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but the three uh, main interfaces we use is uh, one is a, a pair of gloves and has a vibrating motors along the knuckle side. Okay. So as they vibrate in different ways, we can send in signal, for example, use it for uh, steering information. As it vibrates this way, that means, oh, you probably want to turn your steering that way. If it vibrates this way, turn the steering that way, for example. Mm -hmm. We have a car seat that vibrates in the back and the hip, and they can vibrate in different patterns to also convey information about, for, for example, speed information or how to operate the, the brake or the gas pedal. Another thing is called AirPix. It's a tablet with a lot of holes in it, and in the holes, from the holes, compressed air comes out in different patterns. So you can think of it as a monitor for the blind. So you can draw images using compressed air. So even though you cannot see anything, if you put your hand over it, you can see the images drawn. So using that, we can draw the, like when you're playing a video game, driving game, uh -huh. you, you see the computer screen draws the lanes of the roads and cars. We can draw those kind of things, and you put your hand over it, and you know, Oh, there's a car coming over here, or there's a kid over there, there's a, there's a, uh, a tree over here, there's a car trying to pass, you can see it, so you can drive. Like what, like braille letters? Yes, like braille, that? but these are not physical uh -huh. pins that come out, these are compressed air shooting out. So it's more responsive, uh, also we can, it's a, not a two-dimensional device because we can change the, uh, the frequency of the air coming out, we can change the speed, possibly change the temperature of the air as well, so the hot air zone, it means that it's you know, dangerous, the cold air is in a safer zone. So you can use it in many, many different types of ways. So these are just some examples of the non-visual user interfaces that we developed. How did all the tests go? Oh, so, so far. yes, so at the beginning, we didn't have a lot of research funding because people thought it was a crazy idea. People <laughs> thought, you know, it couldn't be done, it cannot be done. So in the beginning, we just wanted to show first the feasibility that it can be done. So we only had $5,000 US dollars. And what can you do with $5,000? So actually, uh, when on eBay, we bid on a uh, red dune buggy for a dirt chip, I forgot, like $2,000, and bought a computer and got a lot of donations from companies for all the expensive sensors. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually demonstrated for the first time a prototype vehicle. We invited uh, uh, blind people from uh, the National Federation of Blind, and it was a success. And we showed the world that it can be done. But that was a very uh, a vehicle for a very controlled environment. It only works in a closed off park, parking lot where the lanes are defined by cones. Not on the real road. Not on the real road. But we've shown the road that it can be done. So with that, now people believed us. So we got the research funding to do the real thing. So now we have a real car for the real road. And early this year, in January 29th, uh, in the, at the um, world famous Daytona International mm -hmm. Speedway, that's a very famous racetrack. Mm -hmm. During the uh, uh, famous Rolex 24 racing event, we actually uh, 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 demonstrated this uh, vehicle for the first time to the uh, general public and it was absolutely, it was probably one of the most uh, emotional day, more, 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 most uh, important day in my life. the person Mark Ricobone he actually drove the car not only the outer course but also the inner course uh, to make it more difficult we actually threw boxes at the car while it's driving he swayed through all the boxes he also passed another vehicle and demonstrated all the, uh, the not really demonstrated the technology but rather I think that he really demonstrated the true capacity of the blind This kind of dynamic display of the capacity and ingenuity. He's approaching the end of the run, making his way in between the barrels that are set up there. Oh, there he is. Oh, there he is. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. <laughs> oh, 
Well, Mark's gonna give me a ride back to the hotel, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, before starting this project, I, I don't had any, I didn't have any blind uh, uh, friends or relatives. So you know, people think about blind people; they're disabled, they can't do a lot of things. But through this, I truly understood that the blind are just people, just like you, like you and me. They have the same brains and everything. It's just that they cannot see, and seeing is just one of the many senses. So I want to demonstrate that with just a little bit of help, help of technology, the blind can achieve amazing things. Driving is one of them. So I want to inspire other scientists and engineers to look into this problem of developing technologies to help the blind and help the society.